we launched the national network really with a focus on the group violence and the drug market um, interventions. And those two interventions were really the things that we focused on the most over the last, um, in, the, in the beginning years. And over the last couple of years, we, we really realized that there were so many other exciting applications that were cropping up in, um, with our partners, with our, our friends in the field, and we, we wanted to kind of bring the, the principles of our work into um, a, a more clear role of what the National Network could be supporting, investing in, uh, and the panel today sort of represents those new areas that have um, really sprung out of some of the ideas or are very similarly um, aligned with the work that we're doing. So we're gonna hear um, from a couple of different people that represent the various new areas of promise that we're talking about. At the same time, um, I should mention as this panel, there is also a panel going on, I believe, on domestic violence, um, which is another one of our new areas um, that we've invested a great deal of time in and is actually a full-fledged um, intervention that has been done in High Point and replicated as well now in Lexington, um, which is a nearby uh, town in North Carolina with High Point's help. And uh, so that's another area of sort of new um, application. And these are more of the burgeoning um, ideas in, in practice in different ways. So um, we have today with you um, Chauncey Parker on my far right here, um, who is the Madeira Chadaway Executive Assistant District Attorney and Special Policy Advisor for the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. There are full bios, I think, in your packet, so you can read about his long um, and various career in the area um, of public service and law enforcement. We have Shireen Crawford, who works uh, at the National Network um, and does a lot of our policy and technical assistance work um, and is a former prosecutor at the District Attorney's Office of New York. We have um, here Carly Kuja, who's a Strategic Operations Manager for the Washington State Department of Corrections and Bo Kilmer, who's a senior policy researcher at the RAND Corporation. So um, I'm gonna start with Shireen. He's gonna tell you a little bit about um, how we got to and where we are right now in thinking about the role of the prosecutor and the um, ways that we think the National Network um, could help shape and move that field um, in, the, in the direction that we, we'd like to do it. And then I think Chauncey will be a great segue to talk in some very specific ways about exactly what has been happening at the District Attorney's Office of New York in that vein. Then we're gonna have Bo talk a little bit about and show some results from his work around swift, certain, and fair and the application of that in the context of a, um, a program in South Dakota that deals with um, drunk driving and um, what, that would look, what that looks like and the results of that. And then Carly um, will talk and give an overview of Operation Place Safety, which was the application inside of a maximum security facility in Washington State Prison, which um, we are very, very excited about and um, it's in the middle of being um, evaluated, but uh, we see some, some real promise there about what we've seen and should go over all of that. So, Without further ado, let me start with Shireen, who will talk a little bit about the principles of the national networks um, in the context of the district attorneys and the prosecutor's office. Good morning. Um, well, I guess, first of all, I think that this panel really illustrates what our keynote, Carol Mason, um, stressed yesterday in her talk with us about the whole system and that it's time to focus on and change the whole system. And so here, you know, as uh, Amy just outlined, we have uh, kind of the idea around framing some of this within um, prosecutors' offices, corrections, and supervision, and really expanding this work. Uh, the, pro the prosecution work has grown um, as far as the national network, network for safe communities uh, out of what has happened, as you've kind of heard about the history of um, the group violence intervention, the drug market interventions, and what's happened with that has been a great reflection by um, police departments to rethink and reshape their departments and how they work. So we're finding this is an opportunity to advance the conversation now to sort of look at the criminal justice system um, in a larger context and with regards to um, prosecutor's offices. 
And I guess with that, you know, thinking about things that police departments have done um, in recent history, I guess, it's a little bit older now, but things like Comstat and looking at data-driven um, work that police departments are doing and now sort of mapping and thinking about some of that with regards to prosecutors' offices. And the question then becomes, you know, uh, why uh, are, are we doing this? Why do we want to think about this now? And looking at the kind of historically how uh, prosecutors have worked and how their offices have worked, and that has been very much uh, offices that, I feel like this is kind of an awkward setup, I can't see anybody over there, hi. Um, that they have worked managing their case flow, taking the cases in that the police have brought to them, and really relying on metrics that are focused on convictions and trial rates. But they haven't really looked at what it looks like to be part of crime prevention and how to measure that and how to look at that as part of their role in the criminal justice system. When we think about the 2.3 million um, Americans who are in jail or in prison and the over 5 million um, individuals under correctional supervision, that those individuals, um, were convicted of crimes and are serving sentences as a result oftentimes of plea negotiations and pleas that were negotiated by prosecutors. Uh, I believe the general statistic that's given is between 90 and 95 percent of federal and state prosecutions are resolved by plea bargain. So prosecutors play a, a great role in you know, looking at the current state of the criminal justice system and what it looks like today and kind of where we're at. I, again, uh, with that, thinking about how cases are charged, who is charged, um, which you know, charges to bring, those are all determinations made by the prosecutor that the, at the National Network for Safe Communities, we're starting to think of ways um, to look at that work and how those decisions are made. And in the public discourse, prosecutors are being held out and called out more on these decisions and the decision-making process when we talk about um, current events around Ferguson and the Eric Gardner case, um, Baltimore and the Freddie Gray case. Uh, the public is, is more and more bringing up the role of the prosecutor and what um, part they play in this. So what we're doing right now at the National Network is really starting to dig into this work and think about it more critically. And what we're doing with that is thinking about some questions that have to do with um, kind of what's underlying here and moving forward. And so that means thinking about public safety, the public safety benefit to pushing this work and uh, the change in the prosecution um, offices. And also thinking about how do we do that under the National Network for Safe Community Principles, which you've heard about in depth over the last two days. But we um, are framing this work in thinking about what you've heard about with regards to you know, do no harm, strengthening communities' capacity to prevent violence, enhancing legitimacy, um, and so on and so forth, the other principles that you've, you've heard about in that as we're building this out, we're coming from that framework. Now, that's not to say that the National Network hasn't worked closely with federal and state prosecutors through our group violence intervention work and DMI work. But with those evidence-based models, we're now able to take um, what we've learned from that and start to map that on to some of the other um, new and innovative ideas that we can take that are specifically targeted towards uh, prosecution offices. One of the things that the National Network was able to do to launch this was last year in 2014, we had a prosecution uh, working group where we invited in a number of offices and thought leaders uh, around this issue to come in here to John Jay and meet for a day. Um, that was sponsored by MacArthur. And they were able to sit in a room you know, for the day and discuss what was going on in their offices, uh, what innovations, they were working on ideas, um, challenges, barriers, and that was a good launching point for us to start um, 
thinking about how to frame this work. And the Manhattan DA's office was there and was able to share with the group around their crime strategies unit, which Chauncey will be able to elaborate on in detail um, during his remarks. But these ideas around intelligence-driven prosecution, um, their arrest alert system, and using data and um, intelligence to drive the work that's happening in the prosecutor's offices. And overall, you know, the big takeaway from that was that offices are starting to look at overall crime prevention as goals as part of their office models. So where we're at now in moving forward is looking at basically three main suggestions that we're kind of bringing to the table around this work with regards to prosecution. And thinking about establishing core statement of values and impact, and that being internally and externally, and communicating those goals and expectations um, internally within uh, prosecutors' offices, but also to the public, and um, them, the public getting a better understanding of the work of the prosecutor and how decisions are made and why um, they're made in a particular way. And that also goes to um, whether those decisions have to do with reducing um, the use of sanctions um, and, and a lot of the conversation that we just heard earlier this morning about uh, legitimacy and rebuilding relationships. We're also, um, I guess, it, kind of just reflect back on what I was just uh, saying, is that the public safety issues really bec encouraging offices to make that a focus of their work which um, hasn't really been the discussion in prosecutors' offices in the past. And uh, finally, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, an exe a great example of this is the Crime Strategies Unit in Manhattan, but looking at um, this idea of prosecutors now focusing on hot people in hot places by using um, data intelligence uh, to implement crime prevention strategies within their offices. At the National Network, we believe that prosecutors are you know, well positioned to take a leadership role in these types of interventions and ultimately advance the state of the profession and help make a change uh, within the system as a whole. Some of the ways that we're thinking about you know, doing this work is doing some problem-oriented um, action research partnerships with different federal and state prosecutors' offices and looking at some substantive issues within um, those offices and being able to um, kind of map on different innovations and ideas. And some of it we, we know works, and some of it you know, we'll, we'll see how it works over time um, in this new context. But um, <clears throat> I think also with that, just to highlight some of the things that have already gone on within the criminal justice system that we want to uh, take over to the area of prosecution is um, implicit bias and procedural justice and what we were talking about this morning in um, the theater. And I often think when David gives the example about um, the detectives and police officers standing around the dead body and laughing, I think about prosecutors sitting in court or in the hallways of their office oftentimes having conversations about victims and witnesses who are members of the community and how we have um, very strong, you know, um, kind of thoughts and, um, or not, I guess maybe that's the wrong way to phrase it, but um, strong things that, that may come across um, and perceived in the wrong way by the communities that prosecutors are serving. So um, with that, just that the National Network is really excited to start to um, develop this emerging area and working with our partners and uh, new partners on uh, building this out. Great, thanks so much. Um, yes, we often say that we think that the prosecutors have gotten a little bit of a pass by not being part of this conversation. Um, we have been blaming uh, a lot of it on traditional law enforcement and police, and we're looking at ways to um, think about this more holistically and see where we can make inroads with various um, district attorney offices um, on the local and the state level. Uh, I think it, you know, I think we're moving in that direction, uh, and there are 
examples of uh, cities, some of which are present here today, Baton Rouge, for example, Philadelphia, in which the district attorney's offices were, were very key in the implementation of the group violence strategy um, and were the drivers and the leaders instead of traditional um, law enforcement, um, meaning pol police, but um, we still have a long way to go in um, trying to have the local prosecutors have um, a vested interest in public safety in the same way that um, other entities of the criminal justice system uh, think of themselves. So um, the perfect example of, the, of who has been doing that um, would be Chauncey Parker and the team at um, the district attorney here in New York. So um, I'll let him do it. I'm going to try to stand only because it may be easier. It is a little bit. Yeah, it's kind of like um, barrier. Is, there a, is that mic on? Oh, so. then that's perfect. Uh, so I'll, I'd say I've um, been involved in criminal justice at the local level, federal level, state level for 30 years. Um, and I just, I just wanted to sort of relay my, my perspective. I have a really simple view of it uh, over, the, over this time. Um, and part of that's probably because I had about an 850 combined score on my SAT, so I can't get too, uh, too sophisticated, but I really do, I have this sort of image of like Tommy Lee Jones and the Fugitive, of it just, it really to me is very simple, and where I learned it um, was from Jack Maple uh, in the NYPD in 1994 when he came in and that the measure, and it's this basic principle that what gets measured gets done, and that's just the way life works, and if in school, if somebody said class participation counts, then I would talk in class. They said didn't talk, and then, so. Uh, but or or if we say in our, you know, we say we measure in the police department. Before Jack Maple and Bratton came in in 1994, the police department measured arrests. That was the measure of success, and that was the that was the way enforcement was driven. It was sort of an underlying, I think, um, philosophy in New York City that crime was really it's not something you could control. So you sort of what you would do is respond to the 911, and the measure of success was going to be um, how many people you arrest or don't arrest, and that was at the precinct commander level. And then Maple, who if you ever if you don't know him, you should Google him because he's really this historical figure in some sense in crime fighting. Um, but and I think he's a high school dropout also. Um, but he came. He was a lieutenant who went into as the story goes, went into Commissioner Bratton basically with a handwritten plan of how he could transform the police department, like a lieutenant well, you know, just worked away in Bratton and said, no, no, come on, let me see what you have to say. And he showed, and he then made him the number two person in the police department and the crime strategist. But Maple's principle first is, he, what he said is that we're measuring the wrong thing in policing. The goal is not arrests. The goal is crime, crime and crime reduction. And so he set up these very basic four um, steps to, as a business management strategy. What's your goal? So in the police department, and this is how Comstat was born. The goal is 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 to reduce crime. Second, how are you going to measure that? Because it's oftentimes very mushy. What do we measure? And so what we measure is we measure reported crime, imperfect but consistently pretty much imperfect, but reported crime on the seven index crimes is going to be how they're going to measure it. Third is to um, to have a, to ask the question. So what's the plan? Bring all the key people together and say what's the plan to accomplish this goal? And then fourth, how's it going? With relentless follow up. But what this strategy does, and so the story of Comstat is famous, and there's Comstat, I think, in the Philippines and every, all over the world, there's Comstat. It's hard to imagine policing without that sort of business framework, but the goal is set that the goal is crime reduction. What it had, I saw it did also is it just unleashes, you don't think, there are no, in, in the world of Comstat, there are no Republicans and Democrats and liberals and conservatives, they're nothing. It's like you're, you're trying to find the cure for cancer, whatever, it is, whatever the metaphor, you are just trying to make these neighborhoods as safe as possible from a police perspective. Sometimes imperfect, sometimes unintended consequences, some things that could be, but the framework is awesome. So when I um, came to the Manhattan DA's office a second time in 2010, working for Cy Vance, um, his, his, uh, my job for him has no, absolutely no responsibility. So while other people, you know, try cases and do stuff, but all he brought me in is to say, how could we do better as a DA's office? And he said, here's my principle. I just want to make sure that Manhattan is as safe as possible. I want to make sure that our criminal justice is as fair and just as possible. Now, you, you go and, and figure out how you, you know, collect <laughs> ideas and talk to the best and brightest people, but that's what it is. So um, what we, um, so I, I think sort of the second part of it, to, to Amy's point is sort of like what, and Shereen's point is like, what's the role of the prosecutors in the criminal justice system? You know, we have, I think actually have almost more influence in terms of crime fighting than anybody. We really control an awful lot of who goes to jail and who doesn't go to jail, what all sorts of other things. But, um, but I think that we, 
have at least I was always, and I think our process, our office was a little bit like the the police department before Maple, a little bit of the 911 of of law enforcement, where somebody would get, you know, someone call 911 and the police would respond. Somebody would arrest somebody, and for the most part, that's how we would get our cases. We would be in the complaint room. Somebody gets arrested for robbery, we'd pick it up. Somebody gets arrested for burglary, we'd pick it up, and people prosecute. But it's very reactive, and so um, the fundamental. Um, change in our office and Kerry Chacon, who I, these are all ideas and then people actually do the work and make it great. So Kerry <laughs> Chacon, who's the chief of the crime strategies unit is here and Dan Boylan, who's one of the key prosecutors in that unit. But the essence of it was to, uh, was to, was to divide Manhattan into five geographic areas um, and in each of those geographic areas along precinct lines, so we're lined up right with the police department, um, is, to, is to assign prosecutors to each of those areas whose job it is to figure out who, what, where is driving crime. The goal of, the, of our office became, we sort of would say it in general, but it actually became the driving force, is to reduce crime. So we would get that comps that we can, we get that comps that information at the same time as the police department starts to line up with that particular goal, is to figure out who's, what, who, what, and where is driving that crime. So the first, so, the, so Manhattan gets divided into these five geographic areas. So for example, in Manhattan, the two five precincts, the two three precinct is East Harlem, which is a uh, disproportionate amount of violent crime in that particular area. Um, and so there's a CSU, and Kerry was the original ADA who covered that area in the 19th precinct, which is the Upper East Side, the other end of the spectrum, um, where I live. Um, so, <laughs> um, so, but the question was, we would get these when we would get these cases. You get a hundred thousand arrests a year. Who's who, and what should be? You know, what the question is: Someone gets arrested for selling drugs. Someone gets arrested with a gun in the waistband. The question is: Well, what should be? What should be our response as an office? What should be the the offer? And the offer would be based on the the chart, the rap sheet, and all you knew in arraignments. So what Kerry and these other ADAs did is that to take East Harlem for example, is they went to the police department, to all the different to narcotics, to patrol, to housing, to all the different components, and said. Like in any, any community or any organization that really is, a, it, in particularly when it comes to crime fighting, there really is a relatively small number of people who are driving, um, who are driving the violence. There may be, as Jeffrey Canada once said, there are a lot of people who may be, called, be gang members, but there's really a really small number that are actually gangsters, that are actually the ones who are driving the violence. An awful lot of them are really, um, if you didn't know any, any better, you may think that they're all part of one integrated violent gang conspiracy, but really it's really just a handful. So the question was, in each of these precincts, who are the 10 people who are driving crime? He's the, who, are, who would the precinct, who would the community say? These, everybody knows it. These are the most violent people, and let's, let's figure that out now. And, and the na that list you know, materialized in each precinct. There's 220 precincts in, two, 200, there are 22 precincts in Manhattan, so 20, 220 people came up on this list. Of, these are the, of course the board in Manhattan, these are the people who drive, drive the crime. So Kerry and others created what Shireen was referring to as an arrest alert system, which was when they come through, we put all these people that had already been arrested before, is they created the equivalent of a Google alert and all these CSUs, ADAs, if, if someone got arrested, they may get arrested for jumping over the turnstile, they may get arrested for a gun in the waistband, they may get, get arrested for drugs, whatever it is, nobody would know the difference when they came through arraignments, but now these ADAs would know, they would get the email within, within an hour of the arrest, they would get the email that Chauncey Parker, Parker just got locked up in the fifth precinct with a knife in his waistband, but he's the two, three precincts most violent offender. And so then we would really, really focus on that particular case, and those people would really try to incapacitate the most violent people who, come th who came through. And that then also, um, out of that, some of those people became crews, and so the, the most violent crews and the most violent members of those crews became really what, um, what our office focus on, focused on, and what Cy Vance calls sort of intelligence-driven prosecution. Instead of just reacting, is it actually leaning in and figuring out who it is that's driving crime. One of the first things that we discovered when we had this list of 220 of the most violent people in Manhattan, about a third of those cases, those guys had cases in our office for felonies, open felonies, all over the office, but nobody knew the difference between one or the other. So really this intelligence-driven effort to figure out who's who um, has driven the, the, the work we, we do. It's aligned us with, with the police, and it's also aligned us with the community, so that we're all looking at the same map at the same time um, as we go forward. What also comes out of it, um, excuse me, is that, this, is that then if the goal is, to, is for our communities to be as safe as possible, you have the enforcement side of it, but that's just really one of the tools that we have in our, in our toolbox, so to speak. 
Another thing that we then say, well, what else, what other ways could we play a role in helping to reduce crime? We started, we adopted Tracy Mir, um, Mir's pro pro program with the forums that have, that have come in and talked to all the violent offenders who are coming out of prison and have that conversation with them about the choice that they get to make together with, with, um, uh, with members of the community, with service of providers, with the law enforcement, but we start to talk to the most violent people. Another thing that the, that the DA did, he said, well, look at all, in, say for East Harlem, all our violence is really young, young kids, you know, teenagers getting involved in violence, and the most of the violence is happening on Saturday nights, and every gym in Harlem is closed on Saturday night. So he used asset forfeiture to open those gyms. It's really, this where you, it's not Republican, Democrat, that's a crime-fighting strategy. Reentry is not some Republican or Democrat, or so it's, that's a crime-fighting strategy if we don't actually have a plan as to what we're, we're gonna do. So this is all sort of, I, it's it really all, all of our strategies are geared toward that bottom line goal. I think the next phase of it is what we're trying to do now, which is, um, is like money ball for criminal justice, where you remember the story of the Oakland A's general manager who wants to win as many games as possible. So our goal for a long time has been to reduce crime as much as possible. But this guy, Billy Bean, wants to win as many games as possible, but he wants to spend as little money as possible getting there. Unlike my Yankees who want to spend as much money as possible. It doesn't really matter, but he wants to get, it doesn't really matter. So in some sense, enforcement, we could be, look, look, the goal is public safety, but could we actually do these what are conceivably mutually exclusive things, like, this seems like they're mutually exclusive. Could we reduce crime as much as possible and not use one more day of jail than necessary to make our communities as safe as possible? Mark Kleinman talks about this all the time. And so that really is the money ball of criminal justice. And so what we're working on is to try to drive the nonviolent people, the people who are not, one, it's a waste of our time and our resources, and we can only be busy on whoever we can be busy, and we only have as much time as we have. But it's also for fairness and justice is to push and squeeze and get out of the criminal justice system anybody who really shouldn't be there from a public safety perspective. And so the vision is you really should be able to go into into a jail population, you go to a prison population, I really think you should be able to pull a, a name in the hat and say, Chauncey Parker's there in Rutgers Island for five days. What's the public safety value of that? We should audit ourselves. Like, what's the public safety value of that person being in jail? Some people, the public safety value is Chauncey Parker should be there longer. Some of it should be, he shouldn't even, you really don't even need him in the criminal justice at all. So I think that is the future of where we, and I think prosecutors, frankly, almost more than anyone, we have the ability to do those two things, if we're if we're data driven, if we listen well, if we try things, fail, try things, succeed, that we really can we can dramatically uh, reduce crime even further, but we can also dramatically reduce the prison population and the jail population both at the same time. So that's what we're focusing on, sort of version 2.0 of what we're doing in the DA's office and the Crime Strategies Unit and Intelligence Driven Prosecution. Um, and we've learned so much just from this uh, these two days. Thank you. So Chauncey gave me a great segue here by talking a little bit at the end um, about the idea of, you know, what is the public safety, but also um, about the swift, certain, and fair components um, to sentencing or in any kind of way getting people to comply with what you want. Um, and. Uh, in addition to always thinking about those ideas as a parent, because I think that is a lot of what we are trying to tell people to do oftentimes is parent in the criminal justice system, that we want to um, make sure that we act very quickly, um, we are consistent about how we're going to do this, um, and that we make um, it fair. So. Uh, the classic example that the National Network has uh, often used to describe our sort of endorsement with that and about how we want to get deterrence right has been the Hawaii HOPE program. If you're not familiar with it, you should become familiar with it, but uh, it's out of Hawaii and it was a probation um, program that was started uh, by a judge who said, and as a former public defender, I can attest to this, that it is exactly true that um, the way that probation works is that you put somebody on probation and um, we all know that the chances of him going before a judge for a, any kind of violation would be after probably somewhere between six and ten violations. Um, so your probation officer is saying, follow these 50 rules, and the first time you break it, they say, don't do that again. The second time they say, don't do that again. The next time, I'm really serious, 
something's going to happen to you. Um, and obviously, if after you know seven or eight times you're still not doing anything, how you're going to get people to change behavior is is obviously um, very confusing both to the person um, and to the overall system. So Hawaii Hope was an example um, where a judge set up uh, a program where the consequences are very swift. They're very short. It's a uh, you know, I think two days in jail maximum um, uh, if you're if you violate the terms of the um, probation and um, he's seen incredible um, incredible changes in um, both the compliance rates and with drug use during the program so we often use that as an example but we have a new perfect example of swift certain and fair with 24/7 um, and we're lucky to have with us today Bo Kilmer who can talk a little bit about both um, the overall program and then his evaluation. Good morning, or good afternoon, or whatever. It Just is. barely. <laughs> afternoon. So I want to thank Amy and the network for the opportunity to be here and thank all of you uh, for kind of sitting through this. And it's been a really inspiring couple of days. Um, but I want to start this talk off uh, focusing on South Dakota. And about 10, a little more than 10 years ago, uh, the governor put together this Blue Ribbon Commission because he wanted to figure out a way to reduce incarceration. He didn't want to build any more prisons. So got all these people in the state together. Soon after, the new attorney general uh, kind of is participating in these discussions, and he says, I've got an idea. One of the main reasons why we have people keep returning to prison in South Dakota is because of alcohol, whether it be drunk driving, violence, domestic violence. He said, oftentimes we tell these individuals as a condition of bond or as a condition of bail, that, uh, or I'm sorry, as a condition of bond or as a condition of probation, that uh, they're not allowed to drink and not allowed to go to bars. But we never enforce it. We need to enforce it. And oh, by the way, back in the 80s, when I was the district attorney in uh, Bennett County, which I think had 2,000 people at the time, let me tell you what I did. When I told people not to drink, I would make them come into the sheriff's office once in the morning and once at night, every single day, and blow into a breathalyzer. If there was any alcohol in their system, they would go to jail for a night or two. This whole idea of swift, certain, but very fair sanctions. And he said, I want to give this a shot in some of the uh, bigger counties in South Dakota. Well, a lot of people on this commission, they kind of laughed at him. They said, "There's no, you've got these guys who have been drinking for 20 years. There's no way you're going to get them to reduce their drinking, let alone come into the sheriff's office twice a day. But he was the attorney general. He knew some judges and started what ended up becoming the 24-7 sobriety project. And the idea is pretty simple. You've got these abstinence orders in combination with very frequent alcohol testing. You have to do it twice a day because alcohol goes through the system very quickly, plus swift, certain, very fair sanctions. This idea of maybe just a night or two in jail. Well, this started with just, I think, uh, second time uh, drunk driving offenders in a few different counties. And then the program began to expand because people ended up actually showing up and they were testing clean. So, you know, most, before I got into this, I was doing work mostly focused on community corrections and illegal drugs. But somebody was telling me about this and then telling me that in some of these counties, you would have three to 400 people coming in every morning and every night. And I said, I've, I've got to see this for myself. So I made the, made the trip to South Dakota, but I made the mistake of going in February. It was freezing. <laughs> but this is actually me going through in Sioux Falls, one of the biggest areas. And uh, it's just amazing. You can see that yellow door in the back. I mean, the whole transaction takes about less than 45 minutes. Uh, I'm sorry, less than 45 seconds. Because you see these people every day. So as soon as the, someone walks in, they pull you up on the computer, they put the breathalyzer out, and um, you blow into it, you turn around, by the time you get to the door, you're clean. And so you can imagine having three, 400 people going through this every single day and every single night. Well, you know, judges talk to judges, and the program started to expand. So this is just showing, um, in 2004, it didn't exist. By the end of 2005, you had about 10 counties. And by 10, 2010, you had almost the entire state uh, participating in this program. But as the program expanded, it not only expanded in terms of geography, it also expanded in terms of technologies. So I don't know how many of you have heard of these scram bracelets. A lot of people know about them because uh, Lindsay Lohan had to wear one. But essentially, this is a bracelet you wear on your ankle. You can wear it for about 90 days, wear it in the shower, and every 30 seconds, I'm sorry, every 30 minutes, it tests your sweat for alcohol. It stores that information. That, then when you get home, radio frequency or information from the bracelet goes to a modem via radio frequencies. That information goes to a private company in Colorado. They can then determine whether or not you've been drinking or whether or not you've been tampering with the device. Then they'll send a text message or an email to the judge or the probation officer. So, the, so some other counties began kind of using this uh, in addition to the, kind of the twice a day testing. 
And then also the program began to expand in terms of the, the types of offenses. It started out just focused on those that were arrested for a drunk dri repeat drunk driving. But as you can see here, this is about five years through the program. Only about 60% of the people participating were there for DUI. Um, you had a number for just other community corrections violations, assault, domestic violence. There is a drug component as well, sort of like HOPE, but it really isn't utilized in many different counties. And it's, uh, in, it's used both uh, before conviction and after conviction. So about half the people there about, are there uh, pre-trial, but the other half are participating in the program either because they were sentenced or as part of their uh, uh, probation. And so this is just showing the typical days on the program for those that do the twice a day. And you can see the average is about 140 days with a median of about two months. And uh, for those that wear the uh, uh, scram bracelets, it ends up being a bit longer. Now you shouldn't read into this and think that one's better than other, uh, better than the other. Um, sometimes for people that are gonna be in the program for a long time, they'll just make the investment and do the scram. Cause that's the other thing about this. This is uh, offender pay. And this is I think one of the reasons why I got so much attention. Every time you go in and blow into one of those breathalyzers, you've gotta pay a dollar. And that dollar actually goes to the sheriffs so they kind of have the slush fund. And, uh, but the takeaway here is that a lot of people aren't on the program for very long. We're talking about four, six months. And, uh, and this is just kind of going from 2005 through 2013. Of the 6.2 million breathalyzer tests, more than 99% of them were clean. And this even includes the people that don't show up. Why is this the case? Because the deter they were able to get deterrence right. Is swift, certain, and very fair sanctions. People knew that if they were, if they were gonna use, that they were gonna spend a night or two in jail. This ended up making a difference. But that doesn't, but while most of the tests are passed, about half the people who participate in the program, they never fail or they never skip a test at all. About 20% might slip up once, you got 10% slipping up twice, and then maybe about 15% slipping up more than three times. This, so this is, right now, this is largely focused all on alcohol. What's really interesting, so uh, Amy mentioned the HOPE program. And so when HOPE started, it was really focused on heavy methamphetamine users. And so I've been on a million panels with Angela Hawkin. And when she shows this chart for methamphetamine users who are in HOPE in, in uh, Hawaii, same exact thing. It's, it's very identical. About half the people don't screw up at all, and about 20% uh, slip up at least once. Uh, so that's really interesting, and in fact, as they're doing the HOPE replications in other places, you're still seeing this. And so it's very interesting given that different substances and different risk profiles. So through December 2013, you had more than 25,000 unique people in South Dakota go through this program, and it's generated more than 4 million days without alcohol violation. Realize this is a state that only has about 800,000 people. In some of the counties, if you look at all of the men aged 18 to 40, in some of these places, more than 10% of the men have been in the program. And now this program, now it's above 30,000 and it's above 5 million days. But I wanna make one thing clear. 5 million days without a detected alcohol violation does not mean 5 million days without drinking. You know, if you, if you test between 7 and 9 in the morning, you can go home and have a few beers and then you're fine by 7 o'clock at night. But that's not who this program's targeting. It's not targeting the people that are just having a couple beers. It's targeting the people that would go home and have a case or who wouldn't be able to stop. So this is why, and, and once again, this is really making a difference because there is this real deterrent threat. And so what I've been doing is, in terms of researching this, I've been taking advantage of the fact that it was adopted in different counties at different times. So this is the, a, a paper that was published at the end of 2013, which was looking at a few different outcomes at the county level. And that is, after a county adopts this 24-7 program, what happens to a number of outcomes? So with respect to repeat DUI arrests, <laughs> after a county adopts, the total number of arrests in the county actually dropped by about 12%. This isn't an individual level risk. This is at the county level, and this is quite conservative. We also looked at domestic violence arrests, and it turns out that after a county adopted the program, about 9% of the, the total number of domestic violence arrests went down. And this is really important because most of the people that are in the program aren't there for domestic violence. But think about this, if you get a bunch of 18 to 40 year old guys who drink too much, and you're able to get, their, get them to cut back on their alcohol consumption, at least for four to six months, at the community level, you're going to see these effects. And sure enough, we found some evidence also suggesting that at least for the males aged 18 to 40, it's reducing uh, the risk of traffic accidents. And once again, this is all at the community level. Now kind of based on these results, uh, the National Institute of Justice, many of you are familiar with our Crime Solutions database, they uh, just uh, rated it as promising. 
which was very encouraging. Uh, but I have to say, so I've been researching this for about four or five years, and we have a number of other studies that are about to come out. And uh, one that I can't get too much into right now because it's under review is doing that same kind of community level analysis, looking at what happens after a county adopts it. And instead of putting arrests as your dependent variable, what if you change it with total mortality in the county? And we are finding that after counties adopt this program, the total number of people who die in the county goes down. But also, but when I presented this to lots of people, they're like, yeah, you're doing this community level analysis, but what's the individual level effect for these people that actually are going through the program? And that's what we're working on right now. And as you would expect, the individual level effects look as good, look even better. Because remember, those community level uh, uh, results I just showed you account for people that weren't necessarily in the program. So it's gonna kind of dilute it. But if you actually look at the people who went in the program, so it's focusing on DUI 2s and DUI 3s, comparing the people that went into the program versus those that didn't go into the program. And for the researchers in the audience, we're actually using a bivariate probe where we're actually instrumenting with program availability to account for the selection to make sure we're getting this right. But you can see the probability of being rearrested uh, just within six months for the DUI 2s goes down by about 44%, and for your DUI 3s goes down by over 70%. And sure enough, if you look at this past, past six months, you see that the program is still having an effect on these, on, on average, on many of these individuals, even though most of them were in the program for only four to six months. Uh, and the other thing to note is that it actually seems to be having a bigger effect on DUI 3s versus DUI 2s, those that we would actually think would have more uh, serious kind of alcohol issues. And by year three, at least for the DUI 2s, you don't see much of it, you don't see a statistically significant effect. And that we're okay with that. Because I mean, for, think about this, if someone's only in the program for four to six months, you'd think that for some people it may not necessarily have this kind of long-term effect. Um, I've gotta say, I am a bit surprised by the DUI threes. And so now that we have the individual level analysis, we're kind of digging into this. But as we would expect, these effects are even bigger than what you would see at the community level. And there are also questions about, well, can this work outside of South Dakota? And so I've been analyzing data, kind of looking at the state of Montana. And so this, what this chart is showing is time until somebody gets rearrested. And so basically, you want to be as close to the top of the chart as possible. And so these are preliminary, but you can see here the, the orange line, 24-7 folks, seem to be doing better than those that don't attend. And we still kind of see that effect, even when we kind of account for, uh, when we kind of control for prior histories and kind of account for selection into the program. So what's next? I mean, the big question I get is, well, can this work in a large urban area, especially with a heterogeneous population? I think it can, but it's going to take some work. I mean, the reason this program is effective is because they really have created this deterrent threat. And if you were to do this in a big city and you had a lot of people participating, and there was, and people, you know, you know, weren't necessarily sanctioned after every single infraction, word would spread and the program would not be effective. So I think if you were going to try this in an urban area, you would really want to start small. And you have to kind of think about this as an investment. You want to start small, and if people don't show up, you want to have someone there that can go out and get them. Now, even, I know in bigger jurisdictions where you know, they don't even go after people when they have four or five bench warrants, they kind of scoff at this. But if you really are trying to focus on you know, creating this environment where, where you can actually use swift certain fair sections to create this deterrent threat, so, you actually, it, so you know, in the grand scheme of things, that there will be, actually be less punishment, this is something you want to think about. So you've got to think about it in terms of an investment. Um, there are lots of questions. So, you know, the way they do it there in South Dakota, about 80% of the people do those twice a day bracelets, uh, or I'm sorry, do the twice a day breathalyzer test, but another 20% do the uh, scram bracelets. But what I want to do is actually some randomized controlled trials, trying to figure out what works best for different individuals. Because there are some people that think that just the act of having to go in every single day uh, is actually good and therapeutic and it can make a difference. There are other people think that by going in twice a day it actually is disrupting their lives and it can be causing problems. I mean, I think this is very much an empirical question. And in fact, uh, those, uh, these bracelets, uh, I mean, there are more bracelets like this on the market. The prices are going down. And the technologies are changing quite a bit. They've got these new devices uh, referred to as remote breath, which may be kind of the width of three, uh, uh, you know, three iPhones. And you, you, know, you get a text message from your probation officer, and all of a sudden you pull this thing out, you blow into it, it's got facial recognition software to kind of prove that it's you. And then within 60 seconds, your probation officer knows, you know, has confirmation that it's you, they know your blood alcohol content, and they know your GPS coordinates. So that's one of the things. These technologies, you're gonna to see more of them, and they're gonna keep getting cheaper. But the thing is, is it's only gonna have a real effect on public health and public safety if we do something uh, intelligent with that information. 
And uh, so other questions are, you know, and this was something that was raised at the panel with, uh, with Mark Clement yesterday. Uh, what's the minimum level of punishment you actually need in order to kind of get this effect? You know, there the way it works, it's usually about a day or two in jail. But what about with 12 hours in jail? What if it was just, in, you know, kind of at home, uh, an at home curfew? Uh, I mean, there are so a lot of different things I think you could kind of try here um, in terms of trying to see what really makes a difference. Um, and the other area where I'd like to see kind of more research on this is kind of focusing on the carrot. Right now, this program is all about the stick. You know, if, if you screw up, then you're going to actually spend, uh, you know, a day or two in jail. But what about the carrot? What about, because we know so much, especially on the treatment side in terms of contingency management. We know that by giving people, you know, a $5 gift certificate to a fast food restaurant or to a movie theater, that that could actually make a difference. Well, what if you're trying to, what if you began incorporating that as well? Uh, so it's not just all about the stick. Um, so like I said, I'm excited about this research. Uh, there's a lot of other questions. I look forward to talking to you about it uh, during the Q&A session. So thank you. Thank you. So as you can see, the concept of the Swift Certain and Fair playing out here um, is some of the ways that we try to build those concepts into the national network intervention. So, you know, in a standard group violence um, intervention, one of the big things that we talk a lot about is that you have to, you know, don't promise anything that you can't do. Um, when it, and that is very important, obviously, for the, the, the stick part. And then, obviously, we, we try to stay away from the carrot stick analogy in the group violence world because we don't want people to think, okay, put your gun down and then we'll give you a job. It should be, put your gun down. If you want a job, you may, you know, or opportunities or services, we will make them available to you. So, um, but it is very important to have that offer of hope. And um, so if you think of that as, as a carrot, that's an example of how we, um, these kinds of principles are, map, are very similar to the way that we do our work when we're having our interventions with cities. So, um, I also now am so excited um, to introduce Carly uh, and her work in Washington State. I um, have had the privilege of visiting and seeing a call-in um, done at the prison. And uh, we've been working with uh, the correctional facility out there for since 2012. And she's going to kind of talk about the process that they went through to create a focused deterrent offender uh, uh, strategy very similar to our group violence strategy but inside of this maximum security prison so thank you well, i'm so excited to be here um and thanks for bearing with us I'm, i know i'm the last one probably also between you and lunch so um carly kuya washington state department of corrections and i'm so excited today to talk to you about um the problem we were having with group violence in prison um, how we translated the community ceasefire model to help solve that problem, and some of the things we've seen happen along the way from this first application in a high security prison setting. So to give you a little bit of context first, so we have about 12 adult correctional facilities, and we're only piloting this in our two closed custody facilities. Part of the reason is because this is where we really have our highest concentration of gangs and groups, and also violence. So, we really are, with this strategy, with Operation Place Safety, we are targeting the violent acts that pose the greatest risk to staff and offender safety. Um, we're using impactful forms of correctional control. We have a lot of control over people's lives, and we know we can use that in a strategic way rather than a forceful way. And the biggest shift, something I have never seen corrections do, and most corrections veterans will tell you this, we have flipped the switch. So we are holding groups accountable for the first time in the discipline. Um, at the same time, we recognize that you know, group violence and violence in general is not a problem solved by enforcement alone. Um, so we really have tried to boost that help component alongside enforcement to give people meaningful opportunities um, outside groups and violence. Um, and at the same time, the major component for which this whole strategy is facilitated is really through communication with the population. So launched this strategy at the penitentiary the, in Walla Walla at the end of 2012 and just recently expanded to Clon Bay Correctional Facility on the very, if you picture the map of the United States, both these prisons are on the very corners of Washington State. So just to give you a little bit of context, um, Washington has managed to use incarceration in a pretty restrained way. So we're 41st in the nation in rate of incarceration and we've had determinate sentencing for quite a long time to send people here for fixed periods of time instead of the push and pull of parole type systems. And at the same time, um, I think we have a pretty smart legislator, legislature and public policy. 
um, that really tries to constantly pull at the population to figure out, are there things we could use other than incarceration, like a separate drug sentencing grid to reserve incarceration for more serious crimes, and also just to use community-based alternatives to either keep people out of prison or to use it for a, a lesser period of time in combination with community supervision. So what this all means in terms of prison, are the people who come to us and how long they stay, we can't determine, but it does tend to be a more serious and higher risk population. So 70% of the people who come to prison are serving time for crimes against a person, murder, manslaughter, sex crimes, robbery, assault. Um, and about 40% of our population will be with us for 10 years or more. And so we certainly do have a minority of property and drug offenders, but they tend to churn through pretty quickly. That leaves us with a pretty volatile, stable population. Now we recognize that certainly we have a more serious criminal profile of people coming in um, that we have in our custody and care, but we really do use a least restrictive custody model. Now we're a behavior-based system, and I wanna make it clear that that includes crime. So what that means is if you come into prison and you're convicted of certain violent crimes, you're automatically doing your first four years at close custody. So this is our highest security general population unit, but for the, mass, for the vast majority of offenders, they really do score into the medium custody profile. So this is where the majority of our facilities operate at in terms of that custody level. And minimum security really is used for people that are getting ready to go home. They're 48 months or less and they're preparing to re-enter society. Now just real quick, um, I know the media is a buzz right now in terms of solitary confinement. So our highest custody setting is actually maximum security. That's our prison within a prison or our jail where we can segregate people um, in terms of if they can't be safely housed in the population. Now, in prison, it is no small thing to lock somebody up. So we really do reserve that setting in a pretty restrained way. We're about half the national average in terms of people housed in those units, but oftentimes you will find people there who've committed really serious violent acts in general population and have to be contained there. So that being said, because we have a system that tends to keep people in the lowest custody level based on behavior, is you do see a more serious criminal profile at close custody, specifically at the Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla. So here, about 90% of the offenders that are housed there, those four units, are serving time for crimes against a person. And about a third of them are with us for murder. Now, about 63% are serving a sentence of 10 years or more, and many of them are going to be there for life. The other thing that's really interesting about the penitentiary and Colon Bay as well, but in high custody, is you do see a higher density of gang affiliated offenders. About half the population there is affiliated with some kind of gang or group, and that really is double the rate that you'll see with lower custody facilities. So this really is the deepest end of our system. So the penitentiary in particular was, was an integral part of our violence reduction strategies before we did Operation Place Safety. So in our system, prison violence, um, it's, uh, I got it all backwards. Prison gangs account for about a quarter of our population, but they commit about half of our violence. So the disproportionality between gangs and the violence they commit is well documented in prison as it is in the community. Um, and for the most part in recent history, we really had a strong dynamic with two particular rival gangs. So we have the Norteños and Sereños, predominantly Latino-based gangs out of California, but really had this strong fight on site group mentality code. We're constantly committing violence against one another, uh, victimizing each other and getting a lot of other people hurt in the process. And, and let me be clear what's going on here. So there's not a lot of effective strategies and corrections to manage gangs. So we did probably a, like what most correctional systems do. <coughs> we manage gangs by suppression and containment. So for the most part, when a Norteño or Sereño would come into reception, we would interview them and then we would try to figure out could they be safely co-housed with their rival gang member, if so we would have the vast majority of our facilities integrated. So these would be rival gang members walking alongside one another in general population. But for those people who couldn't safely be co-housed, we would segregate them in terms of two general population custody units at the Washington State Penitentiary. So, and make no mistake, in these four units, there's lots of other offenders there. You have Bloods, you have Crips, you have a lot of non-affiliated offenders. But for the most part, we really were managing by movement and suppression. Now at the same time, we still had our traditional tools. We have a disciplinary system and we hold individuals accountable. That's what we do. We infract them, we might place them in disciplinary segregation or take away early release credits from prison. Um, and we can always place them in segregation on a more indeterminate basis if we can't safely house them with other offenders. So let me talk about what this all means. So in high security, the architecture is very different. It's based around movement control. So less opportunities for programming, less opportunities for visiting, just by nature of the movement control in these facilities. Now, because you have about 50% gang members in these units, 
for the most part, it, it really doesn't matter if you're in a gang or not. Because when you're coming into these units, you are crewing up or grouping up with somebody. Whether it be by gang, by race, by neighborhood, you don't walk alone in these units. And fear is a very powerful motivator for, for why people self-assemble. Now at the same time, while they seek safety with others, inmates, they tend to lock themselves in this pretty strong group dynamic that's hard to get out of. And so prison gangs have a certain code of conduct and code of rules that compete with prison rules. So what that means for the most part is you don't talk to staff, you don't snitch, you might not program if your particular group says, you know, don't participate in rehabilitative programming, we don't like that. And if you're sent on a mission to commit a violent act, you do it. So individual choice here is very much constrained. And that's part of the reason why in these units we see about two thirds of our violent acts are committed by gang affiliated offenders. So this sounds pretty dire, but it's not like we didn't get anything out of this strategy. So this chart on the left shows a nice healthy downward trend in terms of all our violent infractions at the statewide level. Fights, assaults, staff assaults, having weapons, everything was going down across the state. So, but because we had kind of concentrated everything out of Walla Walla, it really became the epicenter for more serious violent acts. Now this chart on the right shows you the aggravated staff assaults in our whole system, our whole prison system. And the Washington State Penitentiary accounted for about 90% of them. Now this was just before we launched Operation Play Safety. And we spent about nine months designing it in partnership with the National Network for Safe Communities. And part of the tipping point for us is in early 2012, we had two high profile incidents where inmates um, engaged in fights with weapons. Now in our system, weapons are actually quite rare, um, but they happened in days with one another, both were gang related, and it really prompted us to think, okay, we saw one incident where the inmates had taken weapons and then turned them on responding staff. So at this point, we wanted to really reconsider what we were doing, and we wanted to shift from a strategy that was based in response to one that was based in deterrence. So we were very interested in the ceasefire model. We knew we had to focus on the most serious crime problems. We knew we had to pull levers, hold groups accountable, have this idea of a call in. I mean, that was a very new concept to us. Um, but we didn't know how to answer all these questions. What would those gaps look like in terms of being filled in for prison? So the questions we had were what violent acts should we focus on? What levers can we pull? How the heck do you hold groups accountable? I mean, this was a concept that was foreign to us. That is not how we think, and that's not what we're built to do. Um, and then how do you have an effective call-in? And, and most importantly, will this work? It had never been tried in prison before, and certainly it was, it was a very new um, territory for us to charter. So the first thing we decided to do was really target those violent acts that pose the greatest risk to staff and offender safety. And for us, the first question was, well, what are they? So first of all, I need to say that prisons have a lot of rules. Um, very similar to the sentencing grid that you'll see in the community, but the bottom line is there are far more rules than there are resources to enforce them, and not all violent acts are created equal. So we took a look at all the violent acts that we hold offenders accountable to, and we still have our traditional system. But what we really did is we took three rules and we placed them on top of all other rules. So the message now is whatever you do in prison, just don't do these three things. Don't assault staff, don't have a weapon, don't have multiple guys in a fight or assault. So this is a small, very specific set of behaviors that are communicated to offenders so we can follow through quickly and consistently. Now at the same time, we still have our individual accountability process. Everything from having a hot UA to having a one on fight still gets handled and responded through, through our traditional process. But now we have something that we're gonna treat very special and a plan enhanced response specifically for these violent acts. So for us, the idea of levers seemed easy as first, okay? We have a lot of control over people's lives, and, and that's no small thing. But as we were going down this path of what levers we should pull, you know, we wanted ones that we could pull quickly, consistent, and had meaning in the eyes of offenders. But we really, because we're prisons, we had to be mindful of the difference between privileges versus rights. Because we were shifting to a group accountability model, we had to be very careful not to impact the constitutional rights of people that weren't directly involved in the violent act. So this idea of privileges became very interesting. Um, and we for, when we first kind of thought about privileges, okay, so what, what has meaning in the eyes of offenders and what could we kind of hold over their heads in terms of creature comforts and pull away? So we really did engage our frontline staff in terms of, you know, what has the greatest meaning to offenders. And, and this was when we really recognized what we already knew. The little things are the big things in prison. So we really are taking privileges and we're revoking them for a prohibited violent act. Things like taking away television sets 
Things like taking away personal shoes. And let me stop here real quickly. So in Washington State, offenders cannot have personal clothing, but they are allowed to have personal shoes, Nikes, Cortez, Adidas. Um, so we're not just taking away people's shoes and letting them walk around barefoot. So let me just get back to here real quick. Um, <laughs> um, taking away waste filtering privileges, taking away phones or visiting. So the idea is just to get their attention really quickly. They only last 30 days and then they're done. Now again, the biggest shift for us was actually flipping this switch and holding groups accountable. So we're actually applying these privilege restrictions to groups because we recognize that our individual accountability system was very limited. In prison, we had this dynamic that we all knew existed. We had shot callers. We had people that were directing people to go commit a violent act. And at the same time, we had these mission boys, oftentimes these people who had just come into prison and were sent to go commit a violent act. And so they would certainly take the hit for the rest of the team, right? So they would be infracted, they would be placed in segregation. And at the meantime, our response might be to scoop up a group and put them all in segregation while we figure out who called the shot and who did it. But frankly, it deprived a lot of people of, of meaningful opportunity and lost us a lot of legitimacy with our population. So we really wanted to get at those key players and really shifting from a system that was you know, more behavioral in nature. So at the same time, you know, these units, about 50% gang members and often group affiliations. So, but we recognize that it's not necessarily the whole living unit that's accounted for the problem, right? So it's usually a few key players in that group. Um, so we really wanted to get it, not only the perpetrator, so who did that prohibited violent act, oftentimes pretty easy because we're prisons, we see it, we have surveillance, but we wanted to figure out who their close associates were in real time to really target that small cohesive group behind the violent act. So what actually happens is when we have one of these prohibited violent acts, we actually bring in our frontline staff to tell us who's hanging out with who on a real-time basis. So this really is um, group dynamics are too fast and too fluid for a database, and we wanted to use the expertise of our staff to figure out who they're hanging out with and about seven to nine of their close associates so we could get at that small cohesive group. Now, alongside this enforcement process really was this idea of providing help. And I'm not going to lie to you. We first heard this idea of help. We're like, what is help? What is help? Um, and certainly we were geared up to do it. And one thing we recognized very quickly is we have opportunities in prison. There are opportunities for offenders to contribute, to repair wheelchairs for the community, to complete their GED, to complete drug treatment, all these things. But they couldn't happen if things were always violent and we were always in lockdown as a result of the violent act. So part of it was enhancing meaningful opportunities for offenders, but really getting violence down so we could make those things most available. And so we really did look to our existing resources and boosted them and also engaged in some community partnerships to bring those more fruitful for offenders. Now at the same time, we had to be careful, right? Because this is not about getting people out of gangs. This is not about getting people on programs, but of giving people an opportunity to be productive in prison. Everybody wants to live a meaning, meaningful, productive life, and, and for the most part, offenders are no different. So, you know, we had designed this enforcement protocol and we had boosted opportunities for help in, in our high custody facilities. And we knew because we were flipping to this group accountability model, so we were gonna flip the switch, we knew we had to communicate with our population. So we had to communicate the rules and the consequences, um, which in some ways was the easiest. But the biggest part for us was we wanted to make it clear for why we were doing this. And part of the message to our offender population was really about we want to be safe and we want to have a productive facility for you to get visits from your family, participate in programming, to you know, be able to leave your cell every Sunday to call your grandmother. These things can't happen if people are constantly watching their backs and we're constantly on lockdown. Um, and at the same time, staff and offenders both know if one, is if one person's not safe, the other's not safe. And so we really needed to have a productive facility for staff to work and make those personal shop opportunities more available and for offenders to meaningfully engage in them. And so part of the other thing we did, it wasn't just having the superintendent and prison staff communicate this message to offenders, but we really did reach out to some community partners that we were able to um, meet. So we had a mother of a murdered child come in and talk about her experience with gang violence in the community. Um, we were also lucky to have a formerly incarcerated person who'd actually done about 20 years at Walla Walla um, come in and talk to offenders. And, and his message was particularly interesting because one of the things he talked about was, look, here's what I know. I was here for 20 years. You can look me up. You all know who I am. Um, I rolled with a crew when I was here. And when I was ready to get out, nobody was there to help me reenter society. I don't talk to these guys now. And they really weren't my friends. So this really was kind of calling out that false prophecy of that group narrative. And it was certainly a very chilling effect. So what happened? 
So this chart right here is all our prohibited violent acts by calendar year. So recognize that we implemented Operation Play Safety at the end of 2012. And we really were focused on those four closed custody units at the West Complex. And so we have seen those prohibitive violent acts, those multi-offender incidents, staff assaults, vice assaults with a weapon, those three things that the aggregate have gone down. In the first year of implementation, in 2013, we saw about a 50% drop in prohibitive violent acts in the West Complex. And so certainly 2014 does not look as flattering, but it is lower than the levels we've seen before. And we continue to respond to violent acts because violence still happens, but the harm is reduced. At the same time, the interesting thing for us was including the, these aggravated staff assaults in the, this forbidden three, right? These are the three things you do not do. And before we implemented Operation Place Safety, the penitentiary accounted for 90% of staff assaults in our entire prison system. So here's fiscal year 2012, depends at about 90% of our overall staff assaults. Now they're about on par with most facilities. So they had about a 70% drop specifically in aggravated staff assault. So being the epicenter of where our more serious violent acts were coming, we know if you can reduce harm where most of your violent acts are coming, you can reduce harm at the aggregate. So we've learned a lot through doing all this. And I, I've never seen anything so different for corrections to do in terms of having a group accountability model. We've probably had about 10 or 15 different state correctional agencies come to Walla Walla and want to see this model. And here's the thing that worries me, model fidelity. So we spent about nine months designing this model in strong partnership with the National Network. And within days of launching this new model through our call-in, we had a very significant staff assault in those four units. We had a collective staff assault by nine gang-affiliated offenders, and that was really our gut check moment, because we knew we had to follow through, right? Otherwise, all legitimacy would be lost, and we could never move forward, and things would never get better. So here's what I would tell you, whether you're doing this in your jurisdiction, you're thinking about doing it, or you've done it for a long time. Stay focused on the problem and stick to the principles. Talk to people, reach out, know your population. Data collection is important. We certainly use it a lot in building the model, but we also wanted to have it so we could see the outcomes and impacts. Um, we engage staff a lot. So some people would describe this as a top-down model. Some people would describe it as you know, grassroots. But for the most part, we have commitment at all levels of our organization, and that's really important. And staff were especially important, frontline staff, in designing what those privilege restrictions would be. And we actually have a local team of staff at the facility that manage model fidelity. The other thing I would say is, is sometimes quality is more important than quantity. And so certainly we've seen a reduction in prohibited violent acts, but the interesting thing for us is this. Within about a couple months of launching this model at the West Complex, we got some intelligence out of those four units. And we heard this idea of sanctioned one-on-one -on -one fights. So let me be clear what I mean by that. We're not sanctioning one-on-one -on -one <laughs> fights, okay? But the inmates, they were deliberately adjusting their behavior. The message had changed and it was, okay, we know what's gonna happen if we do these three things, so just take it out back and do it one-on-one. -on -one. Now, are one-on-one -on -one fights good? No. But are they better than having a staff assault, have multiple people jump in and you know, have a weapon? Yes, because we've reduced harm, and that was our goal. Thank you. Great. So um, I think that all of the presentations really show um, the principles in practice and the new ways that we want to make sure that they are embedded in the ways that, um, that we intervene uh, in, in controlling and public safety. Uh, so uh, I'm not gonna, I get to talk to these guys all the time. So I'm gonna let you guys ask any questions that you may have to any of the panelists now. Ray? Carly? Carly. Carly. Um, with those prison gangs, were y'all uh, able to associate um, any of them with religious organizations? Did y'all label them? No, we, no. So let me, let me be clear and make sure I'm answering your question. So we wouldn't consider a religious group a gang. That's, that's not what we do. So uh, we don't do that. Um, so actually what would happen is if we had a prohibitive violent act, we would actually have our frontline staff come in and identify real-time associates. So this is not based on a formal gang affiliation. This is not based on um, your religion, your race. This is based on staff observations in real time. Right, no, 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 I'm cutting that. Like, <laughs> the bad guys, right, they pray this way. No, I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> let's, yeah, let's not put that on tape. <laughs> no, I'm saying, like, so if you have, because you do have religious groups, right? Yep. So I'm, I'm, I'm asking, no guys were into it, or did you guys ever experience that? Were you able to get marked as gang activity? So 
what we have seen happen, so I'll give you a great example. So oftentimes um, guys walk together to religious activities, um, but that's not the only basis for how we determine close associates. So part of the criteria might be, um, what's your name? Ray. Okay, so I see Ray every day um, going to prayer with Bo. See him every day, but then we would also engage programming areas, we would also engage unit staff into, okay, do Ray and Bo have, hang out every day in the unit? Um, are they going to, to chow together? Are they going to regular mainline recreation? I mean, so it's more than that. Um, and I, I'd be happy to talk to you a little bit more after the fact, but we religious activities really aren't an integral part of this, but they are taken into account of where do offenders go in daily activities. This is it. Well, oftentimes, I mean, in order to get the people in jail, the judges aren't necessarily involved. I mean, sorry. Uh, when, when people come in in the morning, if they blow hot, they have them sit down for 15 minutes, and then they have them blow again. And if they have any alcohol in their system, they just take them back to the holding cell. And so it really kind of depends on the county, and then sometimes they'll let them out, or sometimes we'll have to have the judge let them out. Um, so it really kind of depends. But in terms of spreading, I think part of it was just the word. Those early judges, I think some of them were pretty skeptical. And we're just surprised that people were actually coming in. And I think it was judges talking to the other judges in other places. And I have to say that also this component about the money, because you know, getting a dollar per test, you know, that adds up after a while. And uh, and so it kind of creates this little slush fund that the, each of these counties have, that or you know, the sheriffs have, that the uh, you know that the county commissioners can't come in and take. And I and I think that in terms of early on too, people like that. It, wow, it seems to be working, and it's paying. You know, and it seems to be paying for itself. I think that was attractive, and I think that, that was part of the reason it spread. But then also there was a state law in 2007, so it started as a pilot in 2005, but then a state law went into effect, which essentially kind of provided more funding for some of the other counties that hadn't adopted, and also really expanded the, uh, uh, the number of people that could be eligible to be in the program. So that was, I mean, that was part of it as well. Well, I think that those those cases, and Carrie can talk about it in more detail. But those cases, you, so you have we have a hundred thousand people who get arrested every year, and, and assistants have you know big caseloads. So all of a sudden, that assistant who has a say a, a drug sale um, would normally we would say it wouldn't be would be based on this is what the person's record is, this is what the fact of the case are. They're a seller, they're a hand to hand, or they're a steer, or whatever. But it was sort of a a, a very um, kind of limited. Um, analysis of what of what you would offer that person, but now all of a sudden that person I have that that let's say that, that that drug sale. All of a sudden I find out from CSU, well that guy was actually a shooter, an unsolved shooting in um, this part of town, or he was he's a, a major player over here. What you have in front of you is just is just the tip of the iceberg, and so that what we do on that is go hard on that case and say instead of an offer, we're going to actually there's no offer. We'll go to trial. We're going to seek to incapacitate. The goal is to in this particular part of it, and there's lots of tools is to find the most violent people and capacitate those people. So we would miss that opportunity if we don't know who are, so to speak, like from Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kids, like who are these guys? Like if you sit in arraignments in Manhattan, you see case after case after case and all you have is your file, you really don't know who they are. You, 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 but what you don't have is intelligence of who they fit in, how they fit into the picture. Are they part of a crew? Are they involved in any other prior violence? The rap sheet only covers what they've been caught doing. My question is the other half of this. So we, we do a similar thing. We identify our impact players, our priority offenders. After we've done that, we go hard on, on those players. My question is, what are you doing about them? The, the other 99% of your cases, are, are, are you trying to de-emphasize the prosecution of those other cases so that you have a lesser impact on the community? So that we're not turning, we're not just churning and turning more and more people into felons or persons with criminal record? Yes, and that, um I think that really is the key next step for criminal justice. For one, as just a matter of efficiency, that a, a case with a nonviolent offender can oftentimes take as much time 
where it takes time just like it does for the but cases but i think it's also if we're going to win the hearts and minds of communities i think we need to i mean i do think this idea that the community we should be able to go to the community and say, you tell me anybody who's in a jail, whether it's for a day or it's for 10 years, you think shouldn't be there, we'll hold ourselves accountable. And one of the, just one specific example of the kind of work that we're doing with Greg Berman, who's a head of um, CCI, but is an example with our, with uh, still in New York State, a 16 and 17 year old is con considered an adult. So first, um, first time offenders, and so, so who, who get arrested now, uh, we started in a pilot project, I think we're now in four or five precincts, but we started one, project with, with CCI where that um, where an offender gets arrested on a, um, on a misdemeanor instead of that person going into the criminal justice system what they're given there's an intervention at that point talk to the defense attorney but the person has that kid sort of really really kid has an opportunity that instead of um, being arrested and put through the system is that we give them what's called a desk appearance ticket with a date 30 years in the 30 days in the future 30 years, uh, 30 years. <laughs> uh, th really a desk yeah. appearance ticket it might be like that's, that a, that's an innovative practice <laughs> but it's 30 days in the future but it's sort of saying now if you do this program with CCI which is some kind of community service type program, it's one day if you do that and you do it effectively we'll never we'll will this will not even file the DAT and this case will never even make its way it'll never be part of of your history or any criminal history and so it's a way of getting and I think we need to do that across the board I think we need to see every opportunity um, we're so really we're we're, we're really precious with the days we use in jail, and we're very careful about how we use it. And the more we do that sort of step by step, I think we'll do it through the whole criminal justice system. And we will see. I mean, New York is unique. New York crime has gone down sort of 80 or 90 percent. The prison population so far is we've gone from 72,000 to 50,000. Or Rikers is from 24,000 to 10,000. But I don't think I think there's enormous opportunities to bring those numbers, both numbers, down even further if we're more careful. Right. So when somebody comes into prison, it's not, it's not I, I wouldn't call it a risk assessment, but we do take crime type in, in terms of where they go. So for example, if you're convicted of murder one, um, you're automatically coming in, you're spending your first four years at close custody. Now that being said, what will happen is you do your four years there, you um, behave, right? Most offenders are compliant. Um, you will make your way down into lower custody levels. So does that answer your question? So actually, and I, I want to clarify this to make yeah. sure. But right. If I get to prison, I'm going to be housed with high risk offenders, which just increase my probability. Correct. Of so, my risk. Right. Okay. Okay. so let me be clear risk to reoffend and custody assignment, very different things. So you could have, correct, so you could have somebody that committed murder one, crime of passion, they're going to spend their first four years of close custody, though they might be classified through an entirely different actuarial assessment as a low risk to reoffend offender. Right. Correct. Well, I don't, again, I, you, Carrie is going to tell you more, that he can tell you offline uh, more of the details. We're, I don't know, I think that judges appreciate um, a, a more thoughtful and fact-based um, presentation to, you know, of, of beyond what they get in the typical presentation, which is reciting the rap sheet and reciting the fact pattern um, that's on a, on a typical DA write-up. I think that judges appreciate it. And it also, I think that we as prosecutors have more, and if we, if every single person, we're not, we're not, if we, if we say there's 10 people who come up and judge, though, these nine, I'm not 
I don't take a firm stand on these nine. These, these are fine. In fact, this one I think that the, the person should be paroled. This person I think you should do this. But this one, this one out of the ten, this judge I think this person is a real violent crime risk. And I'll tell you why. And this is what we have. And here's, you know, even get, you know, you get social media and you get fact patterns from the other cases. You figure out people who have shot people who have been shot. I think it just it, it makes it a better criminal justice process, but we don't control it. We're just in, we're giving the information to the judge, and they may make a more informed decision. I think we're more credible when we have more um, a, a more thoughtful application. I think we have time for one, one more question. Go for it. Well, my question is yeah. for you. Um, I'm, I'm Sherry Morland from Missouri Probation and Parole, mm -hmm. and um, we have an administrative jail sanction that we're using. Mm -hmm. both I mean, you can do a lot of different things, and it really kind of depends on the counties. You know, um, a lot of cases, uh, they knew that the people would come back. I mean, these are small, in a lot of places, these are small communities. If they didn't know them, they know their cousins. And so I remember doing site visits where I think I was there on a Monday, and somebody obviously was, you know, having some fun on when they shouldn't have been having fun on Saturday, didn't show up on Sunday. Sure enough, Monday morning, she came in with her toothbrush and prescription pills. She knew she was going to be spending the night, um, but really, it doesn't happen. You know, it, it doesn't. It doesn't happen that often, and uh, but it's it's really kind of up to the different. Uh, you know, the different jurisdictions about that. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. The lunch is in the same place it was yesterday. So.